Hello and welcome. Good morning, good afternoon and good evening, because we have audience from literally around the globe. Today is the third of our um, fireside chats. We had already one in February titled AI Fairness. And in March, we had one uh, titled Robustness and Performance. And today we are talking about trustworthy AI, privacy and security. My name is Willy Fabricius, and I'm the Global Head for Strategy and Business Development here at SGS in the uh, Business Assurance Division. Today, we have uh, two guest speakers, uh, Tomislav Nutt, as well as Andreas Trickler. Um, before I give the gentleman the floor, uh, please allow me to introduce myself a little bit more. Uh, I'm in the tick industry. Uh, that is test inspection and certification industry for the last 25 plus years. Um, I started originally auditing to quality management systems, but my educational background is computer science. And I found myself very, very quickly in the uh, area of auditing information security uh, to British standard 7799, which was then later on changed into ISO 27001. And I have done this kind of audits for uh, two certification bodies in my previous lives. And I joined SGS about two years ago. And I'm also having the privilege to sit on uh, SC27 and SC42, which are the subcommittees of ISO responsible for publishing standards related to information security slash cyber security, as well as AI. And with regard to AI, um, there is the ISO 42001, which we might talk about in a couple of minutes, but I'm not sure how the conversation goes, which is a management system for management of AI. That said, I would like to give the floor to Andreas for uh, his introduction. Andreas, please go ahead. Thank you very much. Thanks for the for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here. So my name is Andreas. I'm a theoretical physicist and computer scientist. My, uh, my I started in theoretical physics and uh, moved more towards um, computational methods and, and AI and machine learning in recent years. And at the moment, I'm working at the interface of a couple of different fields. So. Um, um, one is applied cryptography, so, uh, so to say, where we uh, the, the, our main goal is to combine um, approaches from modern cryptography to uh, with machine learning and AI. Um, and the other field is more uh, quantum information, where we um, actually also try to merge uh, methods and approaches that we know from cryptography uh, and also from AI with novel possibilities in in the quantum world, so to say. And I'm. Um, um, together with a colleague, I'm leading a research division, research division on uh, privacy of AI at the research center called uh, No Center in, in Graz, in Austria. And yeah, I'm very happy to be here and looking forward to our fireside chat. Thank you, Andreas. Tomislav. Thank you very much, Willi. Uh, hi, everyone. So I'm, I'm Tomislav. I'm lead innovation technologist at the SGS. Uh, I was previously working uh, in cyber security in various various areas. So I'm now over 15 years working in the cyber security area. <clears throat> I started with a PhD in cryptography and after a while I kind of moved away from a little bit from cryptography and broadened my spectrum on the IT security space. Uh, for artificial intelligence, I'm working now over two years on this topic. I uh, started with the security of AI system, but then Again, I was starting to look at other aspects of um, the trust was in AI system, like fairness, transparency, robustness, and so on. So that uh, to see what, what kind of things we need to do in order to ensure the things and what we think we as a tech company can do in order to evaluate such AI system to make sure that they are secure and robust and fair, et cetera. Excellent. Thank you, Thomas Love. So before we start the actual um, discussion about uh, trustworthy AI and privacy, uh, please allow me to quickly have a few words about SGS. Uh, SGS is uh, over 100 years old, and we originally started way, way back as a grain inspection authority, inspecting grain being transported from France to England. 
And we are still uh, very active in food safety. And food safety is still one of our major activities. But by now, we are about 99,000 people strong. We are a publicly traded company, and we are headquartered in Geneva, Switzerland. Um, my division, Business Assurance, is focused very, very much on certification uh, audits and second party audits with regard to management systems. So the classical ISO 9001, but also more advanced um, certification schemes like 27001 or 42001. Or one of the other activities would be related to, let's say, Euro privacy certification, uh, fulfilling Article 42 and 43 um requirements uh, as stipulating in gdpr or tisex which is an information security management system for the german car industry that said let's start a conversation uh, and and i don't know whether it's andreas or tomislav but one of you gentlemen needs to pick up the first question and that would be can you explain what privacy and security means in the context of ai Sure, I, I just start if that's okay with you, Thomas Love. Yeah, of course, of course. Uh, yeah. Um, security in the context of AI is a rather um, uh, security in general is a rather broad term. Um, in in the context of AI, this usually means uh, methods and approaches, techniques to attack an, an AI system, and um, this again can include a wide range of, of possibilities but this is what you usually mean with security of ai systems so ways of attacking um, these, these kind of systems and also um, securing them privacy on the other hand is um, also related to security it's a, like a, a very um, integral part of information security and when we talk about privacy of ai systems we usually mean um, methods to protect um, sensitive data and, and also sensitive models and um, as I said this is also a bit related to security so privacy can be seen as a, a part of, of security security is the, the broader term so to say but if I try to break it down in, in simple terms then security means how, how can I attack a system and privacy means how can I protect um, sensitive data basically in the context of AI Exactly. I just would like to add a little bit here is that when we're looking at the AI systems, we have, um, from a security perspective, we are looking obviously uh, at specific AI attacks, which basically utilizing or try to exploit the specific technology used, like attacks direct, directly targeting AI models. <clears throat> but it also includes all the classic IT security topics like uh, data protection, uh, secure transmission, etc. So. Uh, at the end, the AI system is just another an IT system, and therefore all classical IT security uh, topics are important as well here. Exactly. Yeah, I, I think, Tomislav, this is a very important uh, aspect that, that on a regular basis is maybe a little bit neglected, if not forgotten, that basic fundamental IT security, information security, is still a very integral part of AI security. And um, no offense to, to our friends in the privacy domain, but they, they see AI apparently just from a, from a legal perspective as, you know, that there's some kind of stuff that, that needs to be done. But I also believe that while privacy is important, we must not forget, we cannot forget that, as you said correctly, Thomas Love, an AI system is still an IT system. And therefore, by definition, we still need to make sure that the IT system that is the base, is the foundation, is properly and adequately protected. Um, right. that, that says, talking about protecting data and, and, you know, protecting data and at the same time using it for AI evaluations, that, that, that seems to be a little bit, I don't know, contradictions. Uh, so wh what are the possibilities uh, or wh what are the, the techniques that are available to protect sensitive information uh, in the age of AI. Um, very nice question. Yes. So this is as it's uh, very often seen in the uh, in the media that basically if you use AI, you have to give up privacy and you have to give up data because otherwise you can't use these systems. AI needs data. The, the more the, the the better. The more the merrier. Um, but this is 
one of the big advantages uh, that comes with applied cryptography or with modern cryptography. So in the, in, in, in the last couple of years, there um, was a lot of development on new techniques that can protect data while it's being used, basically. So in, in former times, you uh, encrypted your, your, your data, your database, your, um, your hard drive, whatsoever, and then you could send this encrypted uh, material from, from A to B, or you could store it somewhere safely. But every time you want to calculate or analyze the data on this hard drive or that uh, uh, the data that has been encrypted in this database, um, you obviously would have needed to decrypt it first to use it. But um, now we have methods available that uh, don't need these anymore. So where we can actually do calculations um, with encrypted data. So there is no need anymore to give up privacy. And you can, for example, send your encrypted data to a model somewhere else on a server, on a cloud, um, let it be evaluated by a machine learning model, get back the encrypted result, and the server never knows uh, how what, what kind of input this was. So the server always just sees encrypted data. And um, this, th there are a couple of different methods and techniques that allow something like this, but this is one of the big break breakthroughs in modern cryptography in the in the last years that we now have methods available that, um, yeah, allow us to do something like that, so that that we can actually evaluate data without um, having to give up privacy in this regard. And this is a huge advantage, of course, for AI systems and. Um, there are a lot of different scenarios that can be um, tackled with these methods. So I could send my data somewhere, but I could also just, um, I, maybe I have a, another company uh, and I want to do some kind of computation together with them, be it in the, I don't know, supply chain um, evaluation or whatsoever. And uh, maybe I don't trust this other company or I don't want them just to, to simply uh, get to know my my own input data, and with these new cryptographic approaches, I can do exactly that. So I can have joint evaluations uh, without having to give up my data. And my the, the other partners that are involved in this computation, uh, I don't need to trust them, and they uh, they cannot read my data, and still I can do the evaluation and and profit basically from um, from the result and from the, this possibility. Oh, this is interesting. <laughs> Thomas Lapp, want to add to that? Yeah, a follow-up question for, for Andreas, basically. Can you comment a little bit on the limitations of those kind of new methodologies? Yeah, of course. So this is, um, in principle, in, in cryptography, it's it's always a bit uh, the, the, the same story. The, the the more secure, the more protected you, you want to have something, then um, you, have, you have to pay a price for it usually. Uh, and the price in IT or computer systems is usually performance. Um, so not not always, but this is kind of <laughs> quite common. And for this method, method it's the same. So uh, if you have very complicated um, computations, for example, if you have a, a very complex neural network and you want to train this neural network uh, in an uh, already in an encrypted fashion, this means you will have a lot of um, multiplications, a lot of uh, uh, arithmetic um, um, steps that you have to that you have to do on this kind of encrypted data, and um, if you use these new methods, this means that just the time that you need for training of this model will just get longer and longer. And this is then a question of is this still feasible? So if it's okay to wait, I don't know, um, one hour instead of one minute, or is it okay to to wait uh, one week instead of one day? Um, then this is of course still doable and you have a secure system afterwards or a projected system afterwards. Uh, but this is definitely one of the limitations. And there are of course use cases uh, when you have very big data and very complex um, large models where it, it's getting tricky to apply these methods. But on the other hand, there's also, um, so uh, as I mentioned before, there's a variety of techniques that you can apply and usually uh, so there's not this one method that fits all or this one encryption technique with uh, what you can with whom you can solve all problems then. But uh, typically you just have to look what's what's the best method for the use case that I that I have. But definitely one of the limitations is um, is, is the performance loss. And um, 
yeah, and, and there's just one point where things are not feasible anymore to apply them. Thanks. Well, I, I think there's another aspect that that we need to consider. It's you, you see it from a performance um, aspect, right? In terms of how long does it take either to train or get the results. But let's be frank here: more computing power also means well more energy consumption. Sure. And that is definitely something that um, is also discussed in terms of AI models. They are nice and great, but at the same time, the question would be obviously, how expensive are they as in electricity usage? But that that might be something to discuss in future discussions. Um, but there's, there's this concept that is um, called uh, adversal attacks. And, and I would like to make that example of uh, let's say an AI application is uh, used in self-driving cars. And obviously, uh, one of the fundamental aspects is to detect street signs. Um, and, and among others, obviously, uh, speed limitations and, and pedestrian crosswalks and, and things like that, right? But there, there seem to be some examples where even a small little change in those pictures uh, could lead to um, detrimental effect where an AI system just simply failed. You know, whether this is a sticker being put on a street sign or whether this is some kind of playing around with the street sign, how, how can we protect our AI models against this kind of attacks? Um, I, I just go go again. Uh, um, go this, so so um, uh, also a very nice question. Yes, um, that, that's true. So this this kind of adversarial attacks uh, is by now very well known in in the field. So that you have basically a trained machine learning model, a trained AI model, and um, you you feed it some kind of data that if you look at with on uh, on on this for example an image and if you look at it as a human you don't see any difference to some uh, to, to the other images or to the other input data but this could cause then the model to uh, give very to fail or to give very um, um, wrong results and in the worst case for example uh, uh, just neglecting a, um, a traffic sign or doing something that's not supposed to do in this kind of traffic situations for example um, and there are ways to protect against uh, that. So uh, one simple method is so-called adversarial training, which means that already when you when you train your model, you already try to include um, such kind of adversarial examples that uh, will make a model more robust um, against these kind of attacks. And this is also a bit linked to um, the, the other fireside chat that, uh, that, that the last one I think was about um, robustness. And so there's a very, very strong link to robustness here actually. So if you have a very robust um, AI system, which means that you, if you have like small changes in your input data um, and this doesn't lead to, to very strong uh, changes, uh, changes in your system, then you have a very robust system. And this is also something that you can exploit for these adversarial attacks. And um, this is um, this depends a bit on what kind of system you're looking at, so um, and uh, what kind of model you're using. And uh, but in principle, there are, there are methods to at least mitigate the problem and, and work on it. But there are no um, so it's it's a bit so in 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 the, in the whole field of privacy and security. It's um, I think nobody ever gives you one hundred percent assurance that, that something is totally secure so there's still always a bit of a, um, a risk um, at, at, at the end but in principle as I said there are methods available to uh, prepare for, uh, for yourself and this also includes a bit um, in, in general when you're uh, thinking about privacy and, and, and security um, so the first thing that you start with when you want to protect yourself against something from this field or some kind of attack is always um what kind of scenario is is very likely so do you do i have an attacker that is uh, has is, uh, is computationally unbound has kind of all possibilities that are uh, like every supercomputer uh, could be accessed by this attacker or is it just not likely that this will happen 
or uh, will a, a typical attack is this someone who basically follows the rules of of the protocol of the communication that is like between me and and this person um and and this person is just curious to find out things that uh, he or she is not supposed to know so this is also one scenario or another scenario would be um, you have someone who is just really maliciously and actively trying to deviate um, from from a protocol in, in the communication and really trying to yeah, attack and find out everything. And um, this is kind of always the first step to think about what's the best way to protect yourself against um, specific attacks and, and, and methods. Yeah. And That's maybe... No, okay. Just Sorry, uh, picking up on your example of, uh, you wanted to say something, Andres? I had a very <laughs> sorry, <laughs> I had a very short side comment on the, on yeah, the, sure. what you mentioned before uh, about uh, that, like the the, the energy cost, because th there are actually there are companies that are picking this up and are developing uh, specified hardware for cryptographic um, approaches, basically. So um, where you have this kind of um, so th th these computational um, advanced things that they are that you can do this very efficiently and with specialized hardware, where people try to tackle this as well. But I don't want to want to deviate from our discussion. I just wanted to <laughs> add this side. Note. So please, Thomas, love, go ahead. Yeah, okay. Uh, so I just want to pick up this as example and give a little bit maybe another uh, type of attacking. Explain a little bit what's what's going on there. So if you take this traffic sign and. Let's say you have a stop sign with a Mickey Mouse sticker on it. Uh, and another way, basically, from a attacker point of view to, to make sure that it's accelerate, the car accelerates instead of stopping, is basically kind of a poisoning attack. So basically, you try to, let's say, infiltrate the training process itself. Maybe you add training data where you basically um, poison the training data by adding examples where if you have a stop sign with a Mickey Mouse, Stick it and you accelerate basically. And now the model trains that, trains that. And if it sees a fine normal stop sign, it will stop the car. But if it's not a Mickey Mouse stick on it, it will accelerate. And so this is not by crafting a very specific input. You do that, true. But the, the way the model was basically maliciously modified was by uh, getting into the training process, inject uh, po uh, basically wrong training data, make sure that the model uh, trains it. And then you have basically a model which looks most of the time fine, but uh, if, if the attacker knows what kind of the, the trigger is, uh, he can basically then do a lot of harm in the area. And and then there's the, the other thing where organizations might have a super duper AI system, but then they are inadvertently or accidentally or intentionally using it for something not really intended for. So, for example, there is the, well, the example where a big U.S. retail store uh, did some number crunching on the purchase behavior of a teenage girl. And then they started sending maternity um, commercials to her and her parents and therefore subsequently informed the parents indirectly that their teenage daughter was pregnant. And one obviously could argue, well, from a legal perspective, that might be not allowed in the EU, blah, 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 yada, yada, yada. But at the end of the day, the real question is, how can we ensure that this kind of situations do not occur? Where, you know, the, the, the information of a particular person is shared with a group of other people that then can easily connect that information with that single single person. Any ideas, gentlemen? Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Um, so um, a, a very um, um, so the, I was tempted to say nice example, but of course it's not a nice example because there went obviously something wrong, um, and and I think this is uh, um, something that is not solved solely by having secure uh, private AI methods, but to prevent things like that from happening, uh, it, it's kind of, it, it is very important that there are specific regulations available that you know where where is it allowed and where is it okay to apply AI systems and where not. 
and this um, and of course so there, there are approaches um, com coming back to these privacy met methods that I mentioned that would prevent me from doing something like that so that uh, or th from happening something like that where I can um, leave no traces or where I can uh, um, shop things that I want and uh, like the shop is not not able to to kind of uh, track what I have been doing or I don't know I have a, a sport watch on my on my hand and uh, I, so there are ways of course that the, the company who sells these these watches doesn't will not know what my heart rate is at the moment or so um, but uh, and this would need that these kind of privacy and secure um, methods, uh, private and secure methods are applied on a very broad range and that there are very clear um, regulations again where where things, so what kind of evaluations are okay and which kind of data can be shared and which not. And as you mentioned already, there are definitely differences between um, the, our, our continents and, and the, the different uh, countries and in the European Union. Um, there is like, um, um, yeah. So there are also with the, with the new AI regulation. Uh, so these are steps uh, in in this direction to have trustworthy AI at the end of the day that should prevent something like that from happening, and that my data my data is is secure and private. But um, it, it's it's a long way to 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 be there at the end. Um, so this yeah. is work in progress, I would say. Yeah, so, and, and, and let's face it, it so, so, sorry, Thomas, and let's face it, it, it also depends upon the situation and the individual circumstances, right? Yeah. I mean, I, I remember a couple of years ago, um, I called my uh, bank and uh, wanted to tell them that uh, on a particular date, I would leave the country and come back on a particular date, you know, travel notification. And the agent said something along the line, oh, yeah, I have that already in the system. Mm. And I said, beg your pardon, sorry. He says, oh, never mind. And I said, no, 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 no. <laughs> now you tell me what, what, what happened. Right? And he says, well, I'm not supposed to tell you, but we got that information from your airline. Mm. <laughs> oh, makes sense, right? I mean, you, you buy a ticket with a defined date of departure and a defined date of return flight. Mm. Therefore, by definition, it's fair to assume that during those two days, you are, well, at the destination. So if I'm mm. saying I'm flying from Chicago to Frankfurt on this date and come back from Frankfurt to Chicago a week later, well, guess what? There's a very high probability that I'm not in Chicago during that period of time. Now, I found that at that moment in time, quite positive because well it's protecting me right and and i would have informed my credit card company either way but i also can see that used in a not so positive way right i mean it could be what kind of products you purchase like that teenage girl it could be when you do something and that could then potentially be used literally against you so i think to your point yes legislation is required but also to your point, the users, we need to be aware of that and need to protect ourselves. But at the same time, there is something like the moral use of AI. And that comes back to how trustworthy is the supplier or how trustworthy is the organization I'm dealing with. Any comments on that, gentlemen? Uh, absolutely. So. Andreas mentioned earlier the, the importance of threat modeling and risk analysis, basically, before you're basically going to develop your system. And with respect to privacy, there are certain things uh, developers and companies need to uh, expand on. So usually, if you're doing this kind of thing and think what, what privacy risks are there, you mostly think about classical data breaches. Yeah, I protect my data that nobody hacks in and copies my data, and that's it. But if using automated systems like uh, AI systems, then you need to think be a little bit more creative in about what, what privacy issue you can actually have and what kind of data leaks can happen, like an example you was given right now or an example with uh, with the pregnancy test, right? So this is something which is not very obvious during this during the threat modeling step. So you need to consider data breaches and uh, protecting your data and encrypting and the rest, et cetera. But 
that's that's not enough anymore. You need to think, how is the AI system used? How is my model trained? And what kind of information can it leak in, in what kind of circumstances? Mm -hmm. Fully agree here. Yeah. <laughs> so what, what, what other attacks uh, exist on AI systems? OK, so I start, and then you pick up the privacy right. attacks. Okay. <laughs> so we had already adversarial attacks and uh, basically uh, poisoning attacks. Uh, so therefore, there's a more general term for adversarial attacks, which is evasion attacks, which includes adversarial attacks. So we are basically craft a very specific input to make sure that the AI model misbehave. Uh, but there's also uh, the, the, the idea of misclassification, for example, you to try to evade, uh, uh, evade that certain outcomes of the AI model. Let's say you have a, uh, a model which detects faces in the image. Uh, a video camera tries to detect faces. Maybe it's try, trying to detect the specific faces and you basically try to uh, craft the image or, or uh, find techniques in order to that your face is not classified uh, in a correct way. That's also part of this kind of, of class of, of attacks. When we're talking about poisoning attacks, I was given an example with this Mickey Mouse sticker, but obviously we have kind of backdoor attacks that the model does uh, in more things, or you are able to, by infiltrating the training and development process, um, find more creative ways to in inject basically backdoors in your AI model, which do more harmful things. And then we have the third, third category, which is all about privacy attacks, which depend on what you can do, and I hand it over to you, Andreas. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot for this for this nice uh, overview. And uh, yeah, I, I think we mostly talked about it already. But uh, so for for these privacy attacks, this usually means that um, you try to steal um, data, the the input data, or uh, it could also be the model itself. So, if, for example, if you want to keep your model uh, private, um, then a privacy attack could also be to to kind of steal the model um, itself, or then also the output of the model. So I would, uh, coming back also to, to a bit what I said at the beginning, uh, the, the security or like the, the, the privacy part uh, of, of AI usually means to protect your data and your algorithm. And the, the whole class of privacy attacks um, falls in this, in this uh, category. And this could either be stealing your data input or output and also the model, for example. I think okay. that this is often forgotten or overlooked that people thinking about privacy text and it's uh, thinking mostly about, okay, the data used for training and uh, how it was the data stored and how we can make sure that the data or the model itself doesn't leak anything of the training data. But considering how expensive it is to train actually a model, you really would like to keep maybe your model secret or the weights of your model. And this is also very important then to consider that there are attacks which basically try to extract the model by, by querying specific way, by finding out what kind of weights we're using and basically then stealing your model and then saving a ton of money on, on training. Yes. Yeah, and, and, and there are actually very successful attacks that go exactly in this this direction, where you can, um, for example, you you just measure the electromagnetic uh, electromagnetic radiation of your computer chip while uh, while your neural network is running there, and you can reconstruct the data and the model that that's uh, running on this chip. Or so these uh, these things really work quite well. Um, and, and especially like reconstructing the weights of, of a model, as Thomas Love said, this is something that people usually don't think about, that this is also very valuable information. And especially now, since we are in, in this in the age of uh, JetGPT, where you have very large models with very large uh, 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 trained weights and very large uh, uh, training data, this definitely is an important part to consider. And, and we come back to energy consumption and the cost of energy. Right. right. In, in, in one way or the other, right? I mean, if, if it takes, I don't know, I just make up a number, if it takes $10 million to train a, a system versus employing a person for a year, we can easily see what is cheaper. Yeah. To, to figure out what, what, is, what are the weights and, and how are those uh, done in the AI system. So are there any any particular ways and, and um, methods to evaluate how robust an AI system is uh, against those kind of attacks? 
Uh, yeah, so um, there are, but the problem is there is no solution that fits all. So this this is again, as you mentioned also before by yourself already. So it, it usually depends on the details and it depends on, on uh, how the, the specific um, use case looks like. And um, so, so there are ways that uh, to, for example, just um, if you have a very defined uh, machine learning model and a very defined use case, then usually it's quite straightforward to uh, define how how secure your system here is or to test it at least. And um, but it's you you always have to to consider so the first step again this what 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 kind of attack is can I assume so what possibilities does a, a possible um, attacker have and. Um, and what do I want to protect? Do I want to do I want to protect the, the, the input data? Do I want to protect the model? Um, and is is there training data or data or evaluation data coming from the outside, or is there everything inside? And this this very much defines on um, what methods are, are can be applied to to test the robustness and the security of of this um, of these kind of methods and systems. Yeah. So I think here, just to add here is um, compared to other security areas, the, the security testing or evaluation of AI systems is uh, less structured and, and uh, less generalized, basically. You have to really look at very specific use cases, specific model, what kind of uh, uh, techniques were used, and then you need to do a lot of literature, literature research, finding out what is actually applicable in this case and so on. Uh, so this is still a lot of work ahead of us in order to uh, have more generalized, more structured ways to evaluate the security of AI system and specifically security of, of the model itself. Okay. So now considering that um, we are, I wouldn't say close to the end, but yes, close to the end, sort of, kind of, um, I would like to combine two questions. Um, so the first part of the question is, so let's assume such an attack happens and, and what could be then the impact on my business? And then secondly, how can I protect myself against this kind of attacks? Well, yeah, so please start. <laughs> first start, uh, first part, maybe the, what's the impact of your business? Obviously, it depends what the model does. So, but, but it's uh, very similar to uh, any other system failure. If you look at uh, IT security in general, but obviously the AI systems, they had have quite important functionalities in an application. So they can very easily be uh, uh, harmful effects on humans itself, especially if you look at high-risk application, then if your AI model is basically attacked or if there are some successful attacks against it, then you easily have uh, harm against uh, people. Uh, if you look at the medical area, if a, a wrong diagnosis because somebody uh, had a, a poison attacks on, on your training system, then uh, you may have wrong uh, results, uh, wrong results of the eye model causing uh, severe damage for, for our people. So the base impact of your business can be quite big, uh, especially also due to the certain uncertainty uh, who is liable if the AI system fails. We have the EU AI uh, liability directive, which basically is looking into the right and exactly into this question. Uh, but very often those AI models have a very important function and uh, can have a very severe uh, impact uh, on your business if it fails, if it's a successful attack from obviously financial loss to, <clears throat> to a reputation loss, but uh, very often also uh, can harm to uh, human beings. Exactly. So that's part of the question. Uh, how, how can I protect myself against this kind of attacks? Um, if, if I, I just start here again, um, this wraps a bit up with what what we have been talking about already. So um, I, there are ways to protect myself, uh, and, uh, and there's but in, in the best scenario, actually, as a as an end user, uh, I don't want to worry about. Um, is, is this encryption secure or is this what uh, does this method work or not so in at the end the, the best scenario for me as an end user would be that i just have um something where i knew where i know that there, there is there is some proof that where i don't have to care about that this is that this works and that i don't have to worry about attacks 
uh, being successful for this kind of um, system. So this, uh, I would say, uh, having a way to um, um, assess that and and to have um, also standardization in for for these kind of problems. This is one very important point, and definitely there are a lot of ways for myself to protect against these attacks. And the what specific approach and what specific method is the best to use very much depends on the use case again. So and and on the threat scenario. And uh, usually I would have to um, discuss with a domain expert in this kind of field and, and maybe work out what is the best way to protect in that. But I would say to, um, yeah, that, that would definitely be uh, nice, nice to have also in the next years is that we have kind of certified um, AI systems that where we know they are trustworthy and they, they um, so that, that there are standards for privacy, there are standards for security, and um, we are not there yet, but this is kind of work in progress. Um, and this is something that definitely would help me also as an, as an end user, where I don't have to worry about details, but I can just uh, don't have nightmares um, that my, my model or my, my data is, is, uh, is getting stolen. Andreas, you, you just gave me the keyword certification. Uh, and, and obviously, uh, as I mentioned in the introduction, I'm not coming from the product certification area, but I'm coming from the management system certification. And yes, there, there is already a uh, standard out there, which is called ISO 42001, which was published uh, just uh, recently in December last year and is a management system providing the governance framework for an organization who is developing, deploying, using AI systems. So it's not a certification of the AI system as such, but it's the governance system providing the structure to ensure that the AI system is secure. So that, that's a huge difference. But nonetheless, there, there is a certification of the management system out there. And I wanted to share that with the audience. Uh, so the number is ISO 42001. Uh, but looking at the uh, at the clock, I really would like to to wrap it up with just one one let's say very open question. And this is where do you guys see the biggest challenge with regard to privacy and AI? Do you want to start, Thomas? Go ahead. No. Yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, yeah. Um, yeah, I would say um, so. We at, at the moment, it's it's kind of um, so. So we ha we have different methods. We have different uh, approaches. We have different privacy enhancing uh, technologies. That's that's the term that's often used to, for example, to protect against uh, certain um, um, privacy issues. We have um, a range of possibilities for for to protect against security. We know a range of, of attacks, but this is also an, an open field, of course. And um, I would say one of the big challenges is to um, kind of find common ground for for all these things. To um, I would say that like the route towards uh, towards trustworthy AI. Um, to have like to have new systems where we know they are private, they are secure, they are trustworthy, they are also follow ethical uh, rules, they are fair, um, and, and so on. And, it, and at the, so we we know a lot of details at the moment, but it's not that easy to have like the bigger picture that connects that um, that all. I would say so for. Um, as I said, for, for, for certain attacks, we know that if you have this specific model with this specific use case, there are these kind of attacks and these kind of countermeasures. But this doesn't mean that if you use this countermeasure, this is something that solves all problems um, in connection with, with AI attacks. And I would say one of the big challenges in the field is to... Um, yeah, move forward here to a more general way of protecting um, uh, of, of protection scenarios where we. Um, so th there are many open questions that still need to be answered, actually, as well. So this is also kind of that uh, we, we don't. Um, there are attacks where we where it's not that sure why they are working so good, for example, or some countermeasures where it's also uh, where we know that they work for, for specific examples, but not for uh, for for others. And I would say. Uh, like 
having a more general approach to this kind of thing and also merging it in an interdisciplinary way with other fields. This is kind of where, where the whole field is moving and that's going to be very important for trustworthy AI, the next generation of AI. So let, let me add in a non-technical aspect. Uh, one of the challenges is also to increase the awareness of those privacy issues, and specifically with AI models, and to make sure that there is actually enough pressure for companies on A, to apply those privacy-enhanced technologies, and also B, uh, that they invest in further development of these technologies so that uh, we actually have uh, systems out there which are inherently already privacy-preserving, basically. And this happens by, we need to have increased awareness. And if the awareness is not enough, we should probably should have some more regulation around that, uh, especially considering that privacy aspects have a different importance, for example, in EU than in USA. Yeah, I think it's time to wrap it up. So, Tomislav, Andreas, thank you very, very much for your time. It was a great pleasure having these discussions with you. And I hope the audience shared my happiness and enjoyed it as well. So uh, please be so kind if you are interested in this fine, this kind of fireside chats, please join us on May the 7th for our next um, uh, time where we will talk about AI and trans or AI transparency. That's it. Thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the day. Wherever you are, take care. Bye-bye.